Hello everyone, my name is Shatabdi. Uh, today I'll be taking up the next lesson for gravitation, which is our second lesson for today. Um, if you have by any chance missed the first session, do go to our channel ExamRat and uh, you'll get all the available videos. And not only for physics, you'll also get them for chemistry and biology. So please do subscribe and visit our website. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. Before continuing on today's discussion, uh, I just want to recap a little bit about the previous discussion that we had had. Okay, so yeah, we talked about universal law of gravitation, which is every object attracts every other object on this planet, right? Um, I'm attracting the table right now, the laptop right now, and uh, vice versa. Uh, it's just that it's negligible because our masses are very very small as compared to Earth. Since Earth is huge, that is why that is the only reason why we can feel the gravity. So it's directly proportional to the masses, and it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the masses concerned. Okay. So we had also talked about um, this is the similar discussion at the previous slide where we talked about that not only every object inside the Earth, but Earth itself also attracts the different planets, the moon, the sun also to some extent, but obviously it's again not as powerful, otherwise we would have been uh, thrust into the sun, right? So obviously it's balanced and what what is the force that, we ba uh, that balances the uh, force of attraction of the sun? that we had talked about is the centrifugal force as opposed to the centripetal force that is um, that the sun exerts on the earth. We talked about Kepler's laws that even though Newton had um, formulated the equation for gravity, some things were still not clear to him as to why, as to how gravitational force is also implied in space where we know that space has no gravity. So how come still the planets revolve around the sun in around the sun uh, in elliptical orbits. So that is how he formulated, um, he like researched more about the gravitational law and how it is applied out in outer space as well by taking the help of Kepler's laws. We had learned about these three laws. First one was each planet moves in an elliptical orbit with its sun or uh, star, that is the biggest star in the solar system. Uh, at one focus, we talked about how every sphere ellipse has a focal point, which is between the radio, uh, between the center and the any point at the circumference. Talked about the second law, law of equal areas. The third law, law of harmonics, where the square of the planet's orbital time is proportional to its average distance from the star. It was basically, I'll just write it down here again. T square is directly proportional to d q, and this also helped Newton in further um, application of the gravitational law. We talked about the importances. We talked about high tide, low tide. That how the moon directly or indirectly is responsible for that. When it is near the Earth, we get the high tide, and when it is farther away from the earth in its elliptical path we get the low tide. Okay. Finally our last topic for discussion on the last class was free fall. That how even if you drop a ball with literally no velocity by the time it comes down it has acquired some velocity and that can only mean that it was accelerated. Now how was it accelerated? It was accelerated because of the force exerted on the object by the earth. So here the acceleration we will be referring to is acceleration due to gravity or small g. We realized how we can calculate the small g here. It was capital G m by d square where m is for mass of the earth, g is the gravitational constant and d square is the distance between the object any object and the earth. Okay, but yeah, there was a condition there and the condition was that the object has to be on the surface or the circumference of the earth so that we get the accurate value of the g which, is, which 
comes to 9.8 meters per second square and if we put the object on the circumference and let's say this is the center then obviously the distance between the object and the center will be sorry it will be obviously the radius of the earth so that's why I replaced it by r square here okay so how did we find the like in the last class we formulated the g equation and today we're gonna just like show the calculation it's very simple so g equals to here the capital g or the gravitational constant is 6.673 into 10 to the power minus 11 you guys can note all these down here m is the mass of the earth which is 6 into 10 to the power 24 kg and d square or r square here we can write any one of them so let's just write r square here yeah so here the r square is basically the radius of the earth so it will be 6.673 into 6 into 10 to the power 24 divided by 6.4 into 10 to the power 6 whole square and this when you saw it will somehow come almost equal to 9.8 meters per second square okay so uh, here we're going to calculate the mass of an object present on the moon so just like earth it has it uh, the moon also has a uh, acceleration due to gravity so now let's first calculate the weight of an arbitrary object on earth Yes. Ha, please be with our daddy. Okay, so next up we have the calculation of a mass and on the moon okay so next up we have the calculation of the mass of an object on the moon so now we know that as earth has an acceleration due to gravity the moon also like earth has a gravitational force now the difference is that since the moon is much much smaller than earth obviously the value of its gravitational force is also much much smaller as compared to earth so instead of every time calculating every object's uh, gravitational force on moon separately and then on earth separately what we have done is that we have found out the exact relation between the weight of something on the earth and the moon so that every time we calculate something on the earth we automatically divide it or multiply it with that number so that we get the op uh, the mass of the object on the moon okay so now how are we going to do it if some some things weight on the earth let's say is g 
m by d square. Here m stands for mass of the earth. Okay, let's call it w e and w m is basically g m m which is the mass of the moon by d square. Now here you have to realize that d e square here stands for a radius of the earth and d m square here stands for radius of the moon. Okay. So if we divide w m by w e so what are we going to get? So now g m e by d e square into it's so like I'm directly putting the multiplication sign so it'll, the fraction of the w m will get inverse so it will be d m square by g m m okay so this these guys strike off and so what you will finally get is of ratio of the masses of the earth and the moon multiplied by the ratio of the radiuses of the earth and the moon. And when you put these values here written on the picture here, you can pause the video and you can yourself calculate it which, since we don't have that much of time. We are just going to like show. Yeah. So if you put the values here respectively, what you're finally going to get is that Wm by We is equals to 1 by 6 approximately. So what does it mean? It means that anything's mass, or rather, sorry, mass is constant everywhere anything's weight that you find on the earth it will be one sixth its weight on the moon or you can say that if a per if a person's weight is 70 kgs on earth its weight will be 70 by 6 that is coming approximately as Eleven point six kgs. That is one sixth that of its weight on the earth. Okay. So I hope this is clear. W m by W e is one by six. Just yeah. Okay. So next up we have thrust and pressure. These are some interesting concepts. So the part of the gravity, gravity, the gravitational force, that part is over. Now we're also going to talk about something different. So from the picture here, you can see it's like a very simple example of pressure. And I'll tell you why. It's because someone is pressing a nail on a wooden block. Now, what is the ideal situation? In ideal situation, obviously, it will get inserted, right? But tell me something. If instead of a nail, it was a block being pushed towards another block like this wooden block only, will this would have, will this green box would have been able to push through the wooden block and get inserted inside it? No, it wouldn't have. So this only means that some parameter of this nail is much much greater than that of the wooden block which is causing the nail to be inserted into the wooden block but not another wooden block into that same block. Okay, so now why is that? What, what is the first difference that you see between a nail and a wooden block? Obviously the area. So the nail's area is very, very small, right? The area of contact, basically. And when, and when you are pushing one block against the other, obviously the area is much, much bigger, right? 
So keep this concept in mind. We're going to come to it a few minutes later. Okay. So what is the meaning of thrust? Thrust is basically force applied perpendicular to an to a surface sorry to a surface okay so as you can see if I draw this again here So you can see that the angle between the nail and the wooden block here is perpendicular or 90 degrees. So we can say that a thrust is being applied by the person with the help of the nail on the wooden block. Okay. So any perpendicular force being applied on a surface is called the thrust. Now why are we talking about thrust? I'll come to that. It is because when we calculate pressure, we write it as thrust per unit area. So what does this mean? It means that when you're applying a perpendicular force, like a force in the 90 degree to the surface, let's say the force is 1 Newton and the area on which you're applying is 1 meter square then what you're getting you're, a, you're getting the pressure applied by the nail on the wooden block which is coming to 1 Newton per meter square and the SI unit of uh, pressure is basically 1 Pascal. So, I hope you guys have understood the definition of pressure. It is thrust per unit area. And now I'm sure it is clear to you why I was giving you the example of the nail and the block. So basically what is happening here is that pressure, if you, see, if you keep the thrust constant here, you'll realize that pressure... is inversely proportional to area, right? So smaller the area, greater is the pressure. Since the area of contact of the nail is so is much, much, much smaller as a result of which the pressure it can apply on the wooden block is huge as a result of which it is penetrating through the wooden wall. The block here, the box here or whatever you call it, its area is not the, uh, as small as the nail, right? It is at least 10 times more. So as a result of which it will obviously not apply that much pressure on the wooden block, so it will not be able to penetrate the wooden block. Okay, so this was the simplest example of pressure and this was the simplest way in which you can realize what impact every object has um, and how we can conceptualize it into realizing how much pressure is applied on something. Okay, so there are a lot of um, applications to this concept like small area and high pressure. So one thing is that um, when you're when the area is very 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 small you realize that you don't have to put that much force on something to get a very increased pressure right what i'm trying to say is if already in p equals to f by a if already the area is so 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 small then you might not have to apply a very greater force right you can apply like a average amount of force and then also your pressure applied will be a lot because you are decreasing the area of contact. So why am I discussing about this is because 
this concept is in is used immensely in a lot of in a lot of ways and um the most simplest one that comes to my mind is um the hydraulic machine so what does it do so basically the hydraulic machine it is used in various car washes and various car service centers what exactly is the concept is that it is a machine like this sorry the drawing is not as good as i thought it would be anyway so the thing is that this is a closed machine okay this is known as a uh, hydraulic machine yeah so this whole machine is filled with what so what you can understand from it is that since it's a closed container obviously the volume of water is not going to change there is no form of leaking anywhere so the volume of water is constant here okay so now what exactly is going to happen is since the volume of contact of water to all the surfaces is intact because there's no leakage and later we are going to when we study about um fluids more and the pressure in fluids more we'll understand the concept which i'm going to tell you now it is basically that water or any kind of fluid exerts pressure equal pressure in all directions so in all directions this volume of water this whole volume of water is going to exert the same amount of pressure in all directions so now why is this important why am i saying that the equal pressure will be applied on all surfaces of this machine it is important because if we say that the pressure is constant from this what we can formulate is that let's call this area as a1 this called the small area is a2 so basically f1 by a1 is equals to f2 by a2 why because we know that so it's b1 why because we know that pressure is constant constant okay so why is this helpful to us it is helpful because you can understand that when you are applying a small pressure on a very 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 small area so obviously this part also has to compensate right like f1 by e1 so what will happen is that since this area is huge so automatically the pressure or the force rather here will be huge okay so why is that because if i would have said ki yahan pe the area is very very less yahan pe force utna nahi lag raha hai so in a1 the area since area is so so big so how will you how will you equate the two like area kam hone se hi to pressure badhega right and i've already told you if a2 here if a2 here is so 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 small matlab pressure ka value already bad raha hai right and force also it's like you have to put an average force jiske liye the pressure is a lot so now if the area here is a lot already to technically the pressure in this a1 will have to be very less no 
but it is not less because it can't be less. The pressure has to be huge. So how will we make the pressure huge? Obviously by getting the thrust higher and higher here. So like F1 will be a lot, like huge. So why am I talking about this? Why, what is the, what is the need for a hydraulic machine? It is needed because if you put a car here in the hydraulic machine, if you put a car here, excuse me, what will happen? You give a small force on A2, area is very, very small. This whole pressure circulates through all parts of the hydraulic machine and finally gives a huge amount of thrust here as a result of which the car gets lifted up. So I hope this is clear what is the use of the hydraulic machine and how important it is because by applying a negligible force you are getting a huge amount of force at the other end. So that is it. Okay. Yeah. So buoyancy here, what does it make? It also has something to do with uh, our discussion previously. So basically I've always felt that um, whenever like you you are in a swimming pool, okay. So you feel that if it's filled with water and you are, you jumped in the water and then you're floating, you feel lighter, right? Now, why do you feel lighter? Like, ideally, if you had jumped like from a building, you would have gotten badly hot. So why if you jumped into the water after a while, why do you feel light? Because the water here gives you an upward force. Now, we know the whole Newton's third law thing, the whole reaction, action reaction thing, right? So, here also immediately, like after when you've jumped into the pool and you're like swimming or you're floating, just casually floating, you realize that you are feeling lighter. You feel lighter. Now, why is that? That is because when you are floating, let this be you. So your weight is obviously acting to the center of gravity of your body, giving a force of mg downwards. Now, there is an upward force due to the water surrounding you this force is not letting you sink basically this force is making you float in the same way as you were without pulling you down without hurting you in any way so what is this force what is this force that balances this mg that is your weight this force here is known as point force So due to this buoyant force basically anybody can float on the surface of the, of the water as long as the weight of the body is matched by its buoyant force. Now in some cases like if you throw a stone it's pretty sure it won't float. Now why won't it float because its weight it's very very greater than the buoyant force applied by the water as a result of which it will not flow so that is all you need to know about buoyancy the next day when we discuss about Archimedes principle we are going to talk more about buoyant force we're going to talk about this inequality like why is this inequality coming and in uh, people in people and objects that can float how is the weight being equalized to the buoyant force which is enabling them to float. So we're going to have these discussions.
so for now that will be it thank you and keep watching and supporting us